What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. It's Wednesday, December the 8th, and it is Heard Tell Radio, wherever you are across the street or around the world, however you're watching and or listening. We hope you're having a great day. Appreciate you spending a little bit of time with us. We've got a lot to cover today, a busy news cycle that we want to try to turn the noise down on a little bit. Uh, We're going to talk about the last day in power and the changeover in Germany of Olaf Scholz taking over for Angela Merkel. Uh, That's a tectonic change because Angela Merkel has been in charge of Germany since before we had iPhones. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Also, we're going to have our friend Michael Siegel from Ordinary Times. He's going to talk about uh, the news that uh, Congressman Devin Nunez will be departing Congress. And we will throw back to when he lost a lawsuit with a cow. But first, uh, we need to start with a much more serious topic and one of the real pressing issues in our world today. China and the Olympic Games, the United States of America has announced that they were going to be doing a diplomatic boycott. What that means is we will not be sending an official government delegation to the Winter Olympics in Beijing next year. Uh, It means that the athletes will still be participating. Now, frankly, for people, uh, including myself, I think this is not enough. I think this is mostly hollow gestures. Uh, cutting out some government bureaucrats from getting a little junket to China is fine and dandy. I understand the message it sends, uh, but it's probably insufficient as far as freedom-loving people go for the absolute human rights atrocities that are going on in China and China's continuing uh, encroachment into the wider world on a variety of levels. However, the Chinese Communist Party that dictates and rules over China reacted extremely strongly to this. Uh, They are touchy little communists over there. Uh, Reading from the BBC, Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lingzhen, I do apologize if I'm mispronouncing his name, said China would take, quote, resolute countermeasures, end quote, but did not give further details. On Monday, the U.S. said it would not send diplomats to Beijing over concerns about China's human rights records. It added that the U.S. athletes could go and would have full government support. At a briefing on Tuesday, Mr. Zhao accused the U.S. of violating, quote, political neutrality in sports, end quote, and that the proposed boycott was, quote, based on lies and rumors. Tensions are high between both countries. The U.S. has accused China of genocide with its repression of the predominant Muslim Uyghur minority peoples in the western region of Zhejiang an allegation China has strongly denied. Relations are also strained over China's suppression of political freedoms in Hong Kong. And because of concerns for Chinese tennis player Ping Shui, who was not seen for weeks after she accused a top government official of assault. Uh, Let's just pause right here for a second on a couple of things. Uh, They can deny it all they want to. The fact that they have the Uyghur Muslim minority population in concentration camps, and that's not 
uh, rhetoric. They are concentration camps. You can readily go online unless you're in China, which censors their internet. You can go online right now and find all the reporting, including pictures, including eyewitness accounts, that China is uh, brutally oppressing that religious minority of Muslims. Anytime a Chinese mouthpiece wants to get on social media and proclaim the greatness of China, uh, immediately respond asking them if a Uyghur could answer the Muslim call to prayer in that same photo of propaganda. See what they say. They won't like it. They'll probably block you. But that's how you should reply to this nonsense. Uh, Hong Kong is what it is. They've taken it back. They have uh, piece by piece stripped uh, all kinds of liberties from the people of Hong Kong. We knew that was going to happen, and there's probably not a whole lot we can do about it at this point. Ping Shui, the tennis player, uh, the BBC soft peddling it. She accused herself. Uh, the former vice premier of China raped her is her accusation. And when she made that accusation public on social media, they have systematically started to delete her, not in the social media whining sense of cancel culture that America talks about. They have made her disappear. They can't even find her. Now, the IOC claims that they have done uh, some uh, video calling with her and they are convinced that she is fine. But after she accused the former vice premier of China of rape, uh, her social media was canceled and then she disappeared and nobody could even find her. Now, the WTA Tennis Association has pulled out of any events in China in protest of her treatment. And we can't take the IOC's word for it because the IOC is very much corrupt. IOC is completely in bed with China and the money is on the dresser. The fact that they had the summer games recently and now are going to have the winter games to run as virtual propaganda commercials for China is all you need to know about this. Now, folks in America especially will say that we should still send athletes because it's not fair to the athletes to have their dreams taken away and this sort of thing based on politics and sort of thing. This is also, I will note, what the Chinese mouthpieces like Mr. Zhao are saying when they say, and quote, political neutrality in sports. There's no such thing as political neutrality in sports, especially the Olympics. The Olympics, although we all love the flag wearing, we love the patriotism. I love when America does well because we're all competitive and we want to see competition. The sport aspect of the Olympics are fine, but we need to be adults here and understand that the Olympics have never been about sports. It's a massive money-making operation. It is a massive political tool for a lot of these countries. And for a country like China, who is dominated and dictated to by the Communist Chinese Party to the people of China. And I'm making that distinction over and over again for purpose because the Chinese Communist Party's main goal is to make the party and the people one and the same. And we should always make sure that we hedge our criticisms of the ruling party in China, the power structures in China, and the brutal oppression of the Chinese people separate from the Chinese people. They want it to be one thing. We will never do that because we believe the Chinese people should have an opportunity to be free and make their own decisions. Nevertheless, what is going on with these Olympics? We shouldn't be sending any athletes to them. We shouldn't be participating at all. No matter what we say we're doing it for, they're going to be used for propaganda purposes. Now, you, I feel bad for the athletes if we were going to boycott the games. People could say, well, that's not going to actually change anything in China. Well, maybe not. But at some point when something's just evil and wrong, you have to stand up and say this is evil and wrong and we're not going to participate. We're not going to play games with your evil and wrong just for the fun of it and because these athletes might have invested in it, which they do, and I feel bad for them. But it's not fair to the Wagers. It's not fair to the people of Hong Kong. It's not fair to the people of Taiwan who are in constant threat of being invaded and taken over. It's not fair to the other peoples of the world who are having China encroach economically and in some places militarily and in a lot of cases culturally onto them. It's not fair to them either. So, yeah, it's probably not fair to our athletes to boycott the games fully. And it's probably not fair to anybody to have to deal with this when it's a political issue, people that are not political. But this is the world we live in. China is dominating our globe right now and trying to do so even more. And they're doing it economically and they're doing it with power structures and they're using that economic might to get excuse and to enable their brutal oppression of people. Doesn't matter that they're Chinese people. They still shouldn't get to oppress them. They'll say those are internal Chinese matter. No, they're people. If you're a freedom loving person, if you're a liberty loving person, 
We cannot have a China that is not being stood up to and told what you're doing is wrong. The way you treat your people is wrong. And whatever guise you want to put it under, it's still wrong. They're called human rights, not human rights plus Chinese rights. And China can point to all the problems America has in various regions and various ways with our own issues with things like race, with things like our political upheaval. We don't have a bunch of people in camps. We're not trying to take over the world economically. We're not trying to use predatory debt like we were seeing in Africa now so that they can expand their reach even further. The ruling powers in China are not for the good of all humanity. We need to say so. And even though it may hurt us in something like the Olympics Games, just waving the flag and playing a game and saying, well, there's neutrality in sports just isn't good enough anymore. Now, we'll be in the minority on that. We're not going to probably boycott the games fully. They'll probably go. I'll still probably watch. I'll still cheer for the American team. But we're never going to give up on freedom, and we're never going to give up on liberty. And we should never forget that there's people in China that doesn't have the option to speak out on it. So those of us that do have the option to speak out, better. We're glad you're with us for Heard Tell today. Uh, Lots on the show today. When we come back, we're going to talk to our friend uh, Michael Siegel. Uh, Devin Nunez has left uh, Congress and, as he quipped on Twitter earlier, uh, to spend more time with his frivolous lawsuits. So we're going to have a little bit of fun with that. Uh, More serious topic later on the show, we're going to rehash Angela Merkel on her last day in power and the rise of Olaf Scholz. We'll talk about Germany later in the show. Much more to come. Stay with us right after this on Hertel Radio. Welcome back to Hertel Radio. I'm talking to my buddy Michael Siegel, somebody I just really enjoy if you don't follow his writing. Uh, a bona fide certified scientist and genius, but today we need his expertise on matters of congressional and bovine importance. How are you, my friend? I'm good. How are you? I'm ecstatic because I get to talk about one of my favorite pieces we've ever done at ordinary-times.com, uh, where you are a contributor, a valuable member. You help us with editorial too. But uh, our buddy Devin Nunez, who you've done some writing on over the years, is announced he is leaving Congress. Uh, the Republican congressman from California. Uh, He will be going to uh, future endeavors, including running one of the new Trump social media platforms, apparently. But it gives me an excuse to bring up your article, and I'm just one of my favorite titles ever, Devin Nunez and the Very Delicate Feelings, because Devin Nunez, for folks that don't remember, lost a lawsuit to a Twitter cow. (laughs) Yep. So explain that one to us, and let's re-up it a little bit. Well, Nunez has a long, well, not a long history, but a few years ago, he just started filing defamation lawsuits against everyone in sight. He sued CNN for $435 million for repeating uh, comments that Lev Parnas made about his involvement in the Ukraine thing. He sued McClatchy for talking about how he had an investment in a winery that had a fundraiser that went bad with you know bad behavior and drug use and all that stuff. Uh, he then sued Twitter and um, Liz Mayer and the Counts Devin Nunez mom and Devin Nunez cow uh, for $250 million for a defamation and so forth. The origin of this is that um, Nunez has claimed that he, he's a bit of a farmer and he has a family farm, but it was relocated to Iowa and he hasn't spent a lot of time there. And so um, several people wanted him to stop calling himself a farmer. He sued them too. And Devin Nunez cow was sort of a parody account, uh, uh, supposedly from a cow on his farm with thoughts about his behavior and so forth. And he sued Twitter to um, find out who was behind that, alleging that uh, journalist Liz Mayer was behind it or something like that. And Twitter, to their credit, stood their ground and said, no, this is a clearly marked parody account. We don't let people's information out. We're not going to shut it down. And so forth. And the lawsuit was uh, dismissed. I think most of the lawsuits have been dismissed now. I know the Liz Mayer lawsuit was dismissed and the uh, Devin Cow lawsuit was dismissed and so forth. So he did eventually lose this uh, beef he had with a fictional cow. 
I see what you did there. Uh, the <laughs> thing about this is, is he's just not some geek off the street, and he's not even really just a congressman. Uh, he's a powerful congressman. He's he was the chair of his committee. He was he's now the ranking member uh, pending his exit. Uh, this this is a guy with some say. Uh, this is in a environment where people like Devin Nunez and others are pounding the bully pulpit constantly about uh, technology and tech companies and things like that. So besides the politics and the legalities of this thing, this is just some really, really bad look as a politician when you're going to do all that. And then you turn around and try to use the legal system and your own influence because uh, a fictional cow on Twitter was mean to you. Yeah. And it had, you know, it had a bit of a, what we call the Streisand effect that it drew laser like attention to it because Devin Union's cow is kind of, I mean, it was, I guess it was known, but it wasn't that famous. And by the time his lawsuit came out, Devin Nunez cow had more followers than Devin Nunez did on Twitter uh, because a lot of people got mad with him, you know, sort of abusing the legal system this way to, you know, try to essentially silence a parody account. But it's also, you know, and and it did did get kind of a little bit more serious earlier this year when we found out that the, uh, Trump Justice Department in its last uh, few months actually tried when his lawsuit failed to go through the courts with a DOJ complaint saying that this constituted a threat to him, which was quickly Twitter bounced that pretty hard. And uh, eventually it was dropped by uh, the new incoming attorney general. But um, but yeah. And so what, what I did on on uh, my account, what other people have done is to basically mock this, um, you know, this lawsuit and and the and the thing behind it i mean to a large extent this is performative you know suing cnn for three four hundred thirty five million dollars that's not because he thinks cnn actually damaged his reputation and probably not even that he thinks they defamed them it's because cnn is the enemy and you're fighting back by suing them and you know people who make fun of conservatives on twitter are the enemy so a lot of this is performative i i'm pretty sure he knew these lawsuits he's not a stupid man I'm pretty sure he knew these lawsuits didn't have a lot of merit, but uh, that's not really the point to sue someone. It's to silence people and to look tough in the eyes of uh, his supporters. Yeah. Michael Siegel joining us on Herd Tell Radio. Of course, the way most people came to know Devin Nunez was he was at the time uh, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee. He is now the ranking member. Uh, so performative is a good term because he's been doing a lot of performative. We went through all the impeachment stuff. We went through the Russian investigation stuff. Uh, this has been a super high profile member of Congress for a long, long time. And when we talk about it, and again, it, the, irregardless of the politics, whether you're left, right, center, purple, whatever, um, I, I think we have a gross uh, lack of regard for our Congress right now, just in the polling numbers always back this up. People just don't trust our Congress. They don't take it seriously as an institution. And when you have people like Devin Nunez, and there's plenty of other options, and you can wad about it all you want to, this is exactly what people point to. It's like, what are these clowns doing? And this is what's kind of damaging the reputation of people in Congress is stuff like this. And not only performative, this is this is standard operating procedures now. You get on your committee, it's your soapbox, and then you go and do nonsense like this. Yeah. And, it, and, you know, we were talking, you wrote a post yesterday, a really great post about the late Bob Dole who passed away. Yes. And one of the things that was wonderful about Bob Dole was he had a sense of humor about himself. When Norm Macdonald imitated him, he thought it was hilarious. And he went on Saturday Night Live to make jokes with him. And, um, you know, George H.W. Bush, I remember, was the same way. He loved Dana Carvey's invitation, imitation of him. Ronald Reagan, I remember seeing an outtake from a speech and he kept flubbing the lines and he said, can we get in one of the guys who imitates me? They do better, me better than I do me. And so a politician sort of having a sense of humor about themselves is, I think, important. And a good distinction between people I trust with power and people I don't trust with power, that if someone can't take a joke, I don't think that's someone who really needs to be wielding the reins of power. That's a great standard. In fact, H.W. Uh, Bush actually had Dana Carvey come into the White House and share the podium with him and had him do it. Um, I remember um, Chris Farley legendarily addressed the entire Republican caucus as Newt Gingrich, dressed as Newt Gingrich with the Newt Gingrich standing there. Uh, there's lots of other examples over the years. Um, 
I think it's a good standard to use. Like if our politicians can't take themselves a little bit unserious and at least laugh at the joke once in a while, you know, you, you don't want to get too crazy with it, but it, it is something to people that just cannot stand any kind of uh, disbursement or desperate, any, anything that they're said bad online about them. This is the gig. Now, if you can't take a little mess from the social media realm, you know, that's, it's not Chevy Chase and Gerald Ford on SNL anymore. That's not the world we live in. This is social media. And these guys all want to play on social media because of the attention and the fundraising. They need to be able to take the mockery because now everybody gets to say, and then not just the writers at SNL. Yep. Everyone gets to quote tweet or screen capture or, or make fun of you. And, you know, I think the politicians who are good at social media sort of lean into that a little bit. Um, and the ones who are bad sort of get upset about it, you know, and it's, it's just the way, this is the way the country has been for a while. I mean, even before we had social media, we mocked politicians, we made cartoons about them. You know, you can, you go all the way back to, you know, 1800, there were people making fun of Adams and Jefferson in the papers. I mean, this is a proud American tradition. And, you know, I, I don't like it when politicians think they're so important that they can't be mocked, basically. No. And it also, I would say, shows a lack of self confidence, I guess. Maybe there's a better word for that. That to me, someone being able to take a joke at their expense is a sign that they are comfortable with themselves. They're comfortable with their position, you know, that they don't, they don't have that insecurity. Whereas when someone does to take a joke, well, that's usually a sign of insecurity, which is another quality you don't really want in people who have that kind of power. Especially in Congress where they have a lot of gridlock and a lot of time on their hands and a whole lot of ways to get themselves into trouble. Uh, one last thing with our friend Michael Siegel before we let you go. You've had a distinguished academic career. You are a man of academe of letters. Uh, you fly spacecraft. You comment online. Uh, you did have an epic beard that you're resetting, but will you ever accomplish anything in life so well as writing the line you wrote in this piece? And I will quote it to you. Uh, Such a reversal, while unlikely, would produce utter chaos in the legal system and result in the media marching in bovine obedience to the whims of politicians. So the stakes are pretty high as this ongoing legal warfare moves its way through the court system when writing about Devin Nunez's cow. That is some excellent writing, my friend. Well done on the puns. I don't know you'll ever top that the rest of your life. Uh, I'd, I'd probably have to have more kids to make a better dad joke, and uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Teenagers will give you excellent dad jokes. That's the way. Uh, Michael Siegel, he's a contributor at Ordinary-Times.com. He does a weekly science feature. He does great YouTube videos. Uh, can I presume there may be a Babylon 5 video in our future, since that's your current background for those on radio that can't see on the YouTube or Facebook feeds that we have a Babylon 5 background behind your beautiful, gorgeous head? <laughs> um, I, I may talk about Babylon five at some point. Uh, I have a bunch of things in the queue before then, but, uh, yeah, I probably will talk about that at some point. Fantastic, sir. Uh, let folks know where they can find you on Twitter and your online writing. I'm at, uh, Hal underscore RT, uh, FLC on Twitter. That's, uh, from an old website that I used to write for. Um, I'm also on ordinarytimes.com, and, uh, you can find links there to everything else to do. He does great work. Follow him. Uh, Michael Siegel, thank you, sir. I always appreciate the time. Uh, thanks for having me. Back to Hertel Radio. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Hope your Wednesday is going fantastic uh, as we reach the midpoint of the week, wherever you are. And whatever you're doing, we're really glad you're spending a little bit of time with us. Uh, while we're speaking of Congress, anyway, the machinations of uh, our elected leaders in Washington continue. I have a couple of things on their plate right now, and they're all converging, as we've been talking about. Uh, we mentioned the NDAA yesterday and that it was going to maybe or maybe not be stuck with part of the debt limit and the debt ceiling debate. Plus, we still have the Build Back Better budget that is sitting in reconciliation. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, interesting tidbit from Punchbowl News. I subscribe to their Substack, and you get this information every morning. They do excellent work, and I highly recommend it. But uh, a little little note from Punchbowl News this morning. 
uh, there's a lot of complications going on, and they even open up with a disclaimer, and the disclaimer is this. This situation is extremely fluid, reading from Punchbowl News, and we're not going to make blanket predictions about what will unfold. However, this is the latest based on our reporting last night and this morning. The lead option is for the House to vote on a bill this week to create a new law, allow the Senate to increase the debt limit with 51 votes on a one-time basis. This legislation would also allow an expedited process for considering the debt limit, and a variety of other budget issues, including delaying upcoming Medicare sequestration cuts, reading from Punchbowl News still. The House would then send that bill on to the Senate. The Senate would have to pass that one-time rule bill and send it to Joe Biden for signature. The initial legislation would be considered under a 60-volt threshold in the Senate, so Minority Leader Mitch McConnell would have to deliver 10 GOP votes to get it through the chamber. Only then, when this bill is passed by law, would the Senate take up and pass a debt limit increase. Because of this rule change, The Senate can lift the debt limit with only Democratic votes. This debt limit boost would extend the borrowing cap through the 2022 midterm elections. Mark that in your head for just a second. The legislation would then be sent to the House for its consideration. The House would pass the borrowing cap increase and send it to Biden. The NDAA, that's the National Defense Authorization Act we talked about yesterday, would be considered separately from the debt limit increase. Since the annual defense policy bill would be tied to the debt limit, it presumably will pass both chambers with bipartisan support. A senior Democratic House head said two other options are also under considerations if these don't work. One would combine NDAA and the debt limit increase. Uh, by the way, that's something both leaderships said they don't want to do. Uh, the second option, option, which we wrote about yesterday, would have the House consider the NDAA and debt limit increase under one new rule. The two measures would then be combined into one package when they leave the House. That's from Punchbowl News. That's what's happening. You know, what we always talk about on Herd Tell is we don't want to react to the news. That doesn't lead to anything other than more reaction. Uh, We want to try to stay ahead of the news and we want to understand what's really happening. For months in writing and other media, we've been talking about this debt limit thing. Folks, the debt limit will always, always, always get raised. It's kind of like a government shutdown. They're always going to redo the government funding and get it back open. Everything prior to that, though, usually involves a whole lot of theater. And the debt limit and things like a government shutdown or a debt limit or the Medicaid Medicaid sequestration that will be coming up, the way our Congress works right now is they only know how to legislate through emergencies, through omnibus spending programs, and through forcing through things. The problem they have, they have built up bad habits where they don't know how to legislate anymore other than in these processes. They don't know how to legislate outside of these procedures where they just shove stuff through. But this is all kabuki theater. The debt limit is always going to be increased. They may hold it up for a political reason. They may do what the Republicans are doing right now and just want it to be an all-Democratic vote. The Democrats may try to put it with other packages to get it through so they don't have to deal with the Republicans. But it's always going to pass. It would be absolutely devastating to the country for the debt limit to not be raised. It's always going to get raised. You can ignore the media news stories that are wringing their hands. It's just a matter of how. If you want to pay attention to the machinations of how it gets raised, that's one thing. And as in all other things, we should be criticizing our Congress for turning a sideshow up where we need to have legitimate, effective government. That's not the kind of Congress we have right now. So now we have to go through this kabuki theater and what we always call failure theater, where the side that's going to lose has to make sure they lose looking good. And the side that wins tries to make it look as good as possible. But the debt limit's always going to get raised. Notice the most important part of this plan was pushing the next limit out past the 2022 midterms. Because now it's going to be somebody else's problem, another Congress's problem. And for Democrats, they're assuming the Republicans will take over the House. And then the roles can flip and they can fight it. It's all just theater, folks. The debt limit's going to get raised. What we really ought to have is a better Congress. We'll have more Herd Tell right after this. Welcome back to Hertel Radio. I'm Andrew Donaldson. It's December the 8th. It's a Wednesday. We hope the first half of your week was good and the second half of your week will be even better. Uh, big news in Germany. Uh, our longtime ally, uh, the economic engine that makes the EU go, one of the real linchpins to the world order. Germany is having a change in power for the first time in 16 years. Uh, Angela Merkel is leaving. Olaf Scholz will be taking power and office today. 
And this is a big shift and something that hasn't been talked about in a lot of the states. So if you're not familiar with German politics or Angela Merkel, or you just maybe aren't up to speed on everything going there, a few weeks ago for a uh, Hertel podcast, I got to talk to Alexander Bowen, a young voices contributor based out of the UK and UK young voices. Um, he really knows the ins and outs of the German political system. He actually, his family lineage comes out of Germany. Uh, and he explained in some detail uh, who Angela Merkel was, what her uh, time in power accomplished, why it's so important that she was there, and why it leaves a lot of doubt as she is leaving in the world order. Uh, you can hear the whole episode later, but this excerpt, I think, it will be timely on this first day of the Olaf Scholz regime. So right now, a rehash excerpt from the Herdtel podcast with Alexander Bowen on Angela Merkel and the German elections and the change in power. Please enjoy. It's amazing with Angela Merkel when she came to power and you, and you talked about how Schroeder really turned a lot of people off. He was also saying some wonderful things about us Americans at the time, as I recall, but we'll talk about that at another time. <laughs> um, he, she really is a generational type of, of figure because she was born in West Germany, but she grew up in East Germany. So when you talk about her moderation and kind of her political acumen and the way her background really uh, attunes to the Germany post reunification in a unique way, doesn't it? Yeah, it's really interesting. So her mother, for instance, was a Latin and English teacher, both of which were considered bourgeois subjects. So they weren't taught in East Germany. So her mother was effectively unemployed despite having a, like a very high skilled educational career. And her father was a pastor. And that obviously in East Germany, which is an atheist state, being, being a priest is quite controversial. And but he moved he, there, didn't he? Not to interrupt, yeah, but he, he, she was an infant. They lived in uh, Hamburg, I believe. And he yeah. took a pastorate in East Germany. That was that had to be somewhat unusual for that time period. Yeah, he it was very unusual. Not many people are going that way. Like um, after after the but prior to the war, but after the war, you have about 10 million people moving between East Germany, um, formerly German land that is now part of Poland and being displaced. So you end up with quite a large movement and very few people are picking to go to East Germany. But he, he sees his purpose as, as almost spreading religion inside of East Germany, which is really interesting. Um, he has, some people have said at least, he has this idea of sort of Christian socialism or evangelical leftism, which is the idea of um, Jesus lived among fishermen, you should too, the idea. The, the end result of that is this really odd situation where he's living as a, as a priest in an atheist state under supervision, but he is also treated relatively well by the state. For instance, he's one of, pe he's one of the few families to have two cars, and one of them being a Western car, which is very, very unusual for the time. But there was obviously some people have suggested it was a way for the government of East Germany to make him look bad, to create a distance between himself and his congregation. So for Merkel, she, she's growing up in this household that is middle class in a state where few people are middle class in the same way she is. But she's also growing up slightly separated from everyone else due to her Protestant father. And what, what this has the effect of is in her school, she has to be very careful throughout her whole time growing up. For instance, at one point towards the end of her school, so I think she was 17 or so, they put on a play in her school. And the, the play they do is quite controversial. And they all realise that we should probably not have done this. And if it was not for the intervention of somebody, somebody's relative, their university prospects, for instance, could have been taken away. So she, she, she spends her life under, under this emotional control, which is really, really odd, which she has said is why she entered science, because in science, things are wrong or they're not. And well, that's debatable, obviously, but that's what she said. Um, so she enters into the, into science and then she spends several years pursuing science. She, she grows up doing this. Um, and then in 1989, as things are starting to, to take a downturn with the regime, a few 
weeks prior to the Berlin Wall falling. She's just this scientist. She She's just doing her, her daily life. But then once the wall falls, what she does, if you can just picture the scene here, she turns up at a small German political party called Democratic Awakening. This is in East Germany. They're preparing for the first elections. Democratic Awakening is very small, like um, maybe maybe 2% of the population support it. Very, very small. And she turns up with some computers and she just offers to help out. It's, it's, it's very odd how she she just offered to help out and then one day she became German Chancellor. But there's obviously that time difference in between. And how does, so, because she shows up with this Democratic Awakening in, I guess this is 1990, 91 time now, yeah. period. But who is Angela Merkel when she embarks into politics? Because we've talked about her background. She's this uh, fluent Russian-speaking German who grew up, obviously, in the Eastern Bloc with that sort of thing, but also had a, a religious upbringing, you would assume, at least by German standards. She has a doctorate in quantum chemistry, of all things. She studied physics. This, this is not a normal career path for a politico. And then she kind of shows up and just starts for lack of a better term, kind of running the table through a political scene that is very unsettled after reunification. You know, there there was no history for a reunified government. Everybody was kind of making it up as they went along. And she just sort of navigated it right to the top, didn't she? Yeah, well, what's really interesting is when she shows up, she eventually ends up getting appointed as, this, as the deputy spokesperson for this political party after volunteering for a while. And then... This Democratic Awakening Party allies with the Christian Democrats and the Christian Social Union. So, so the equivalents to the West German political parties. And they end up in that election winning 40% of the vote in East Germany. So this is, the, this is the only Democratic East German election. And after that, her talent is spotted and she ends up as deputy press officer for the, the government of East Germany. Um, but it's just bizarre because a few a few months ago she's volunteering and doing computers and now she's the deputy government spokeswoman. And after that, in the first reunified cabinet, she is appointed to and she's appointed as Minister for Women and Youth. So she's gone in the course of a year from being a, a scientist who is living in a house that she was squatting in, let's just be clear about that, to the, the Minister for Women and Families in a reunified German government. It is an exceptionally speedy rise. When uh, when we talk about her, her tenure as chancellor, uh, what's some of the things that people should take away from it? We know, obviously, um, the American audience, we know it mostly from a foreign policy background. Uh, some of that was because of her taking over from Gerhard Schroeder. So she was acutely aware that she had some relationship repairing to doing with allies, like with the U.S., Canada. There was a thing with Stephen Harper back in the early days. So we know the foreign policy stuff, but what what's sort of her legacy of these Angela Merkel years as her chancellorship? We know all the EU stuff, but... Um, especially now with the UK, uh, with the Brexit, Germany is even more so the economic engine that lets Brussels do all the things they do. Germany is the center of a lot of European politics and world politics. So w what's a couple of the takeaways of her tenure as she starts to pass off the scene now? This is a really interesting question to ask because the, there is an, almost not an answer to it. Because if you think about previous German chancellors that have had the same tenure as her, so Konrad Adenauer, Helmut Kohl's legacy is reunification. Konrad Adenauer's legacy is both democracy and the German economic miracle. And even, even say Willy Brandt, he has Ostpolitik. So that's reaching out to the Soviet Union and to East Germany. Angela Merkel's legacy is almost too complex to define as a single phrase. Her legacy is crisis management fundamentally. So if we think about what she's had to deal with, She's had the European debt crisis, which is obviously a massive crisis back in 2010 to 2015. She's had Brexit to deal with. She's had Donald Trump to deal with. Um, she's had the Crimean crisis. She's had the Syrian migrant crisis. She's had the, the global financial crisis. She has had the COVID crisis and she's beginning to have the climate crisis. So she's consistently been dealing with crises. She's almost 
never had a time without crises. This is what makes her, her legacy, is that she's dealt with crises. She, she hasn't got a standout, we have done this moment. But at, towards the end of it, we're beginning to see a, a standout moment almost, which is the beginning of European sovereign debt. So a collective European debt, which some people have called as Europe's Hamilton moment. But she was never really pro that in the same way that, say, her finance minister Olaf Scholz was. So her legacy is crisis management. She, she does not have a standout issue in the same way the other ones do. And that, that's what makes her so unique, is to deal with, say, the European debt crisis in the way she has, to deal with the COVID crisis in the way she's had, has, she's consistently dealt with crises exceptionally well, and in a way that I, I frankly don't think other people would have dealt with in such a way. One more thing about her before we move on to the recent election. On the world stage, she was almost uniquely qualified to deal with Russia and Vladimir Putin. Uh, she speaks Russian fluently. She's won awards in school for she understands Russian. She grew up in the Eastern Bloc, like we already yeah. said. So she understands the background. Uh, she has called him out on multiple occasions. There's been incidents. Uh, there was the famous dog incident uh, where yes. she she's. Uh, for for the audience that doesn't know that she she was attacked by a dog years and years ago. She has a fear of dogs, and and Putin brought his dog to a meeting, and he says he didn't know, but whatever. And then he she called him out and said he has to prove he's a man. He's afraid of his own weakness. Kind of a famous soundbite from her. But with all the stuff going on, and and let's let's just lay it out on the table. Her predecessor Gerhard Schroeder is very entangled in Russian businesses and so forth. And there's been accusations that there there may have been some untoward things back in the day. But anyway, uh, with Nord Stream 2, with the geopolitical environment, uh, with her passing off the world and in Germany itself and a lot of other places, the concern is with America kind of not paying a lot of attention to foreign policy right now, one of the great buffers to Vladimir Putin is getting ready to depart the scene. Is that the feeling that you get as well? Because she seems to have been kind of the one that's had his number all along and understood him and wasn't afraid to kind of call him out on the world stage. I think Merkel is uh, what you I would personally describe as a reluctant Russophobe almost. She, she likes Russian culture. She won a trip to go to Moscow when she was a child. It's also worth mentioning that um, Vladimir Putin, when he was a KGB agent, worked in Dresden for a while. Correct. So he's familiar with Germany as well. Yep. And the, the biggest thing here is Angela Merkel never wanted to take a hard line on Russia. If you, if you look at what she was doing in the early years, she was actually trying to facilitate Bush being more open with it. She was very supportive of, say, his at actions with Putin to try and encourage him to join, say, the G8. Um, and it, it slowly begins to change with Georgia when the Russians invade Georgia. But it doesn't fully change until the Crimean crisis. Because obviously in the Crimean crisis, you have the president of Ukraine being overthrown by... Uh, by um, overthrown might be the right. Insurrection is probably a good way to call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, being being insurrected, insurrected by a sort of popular revolt uh, of... Europhiles, which then obviously has the resort of Putin, A, invading Crimea to secure Russian bases, but then also funneling in his little green men into eastern Ukraine, where the Russian population is quite high, to, to sort of slowly break away and increase his control over the country. And I think that's when Merkel really takes more serious actions on Russia. But she, she's very careful because in the case of Germany, there is, that, there is the gas aspect. But I think the gas aspect tends to be slightly overstated, especially in America. Because if you think Germany's energy mix is something like 25% gas, and about a third of that is Russian. So it's not a particularly huge share of their energy mix, but it is still there. So she's obviously a bit more careful than other people would be over actions with Russia. But she is also constrained because the European Council, the way the sanctions mechanism works there, so that's the... That's the heads of government that meet then decide some EU policy, especially top level policy like sanctions. The way that works there is sanctions have to be unanimously approved, which obviously causes 
several problems if you're trying to sanction somebody and say the Russians have influenced, say, Cyprus or Greece or Hungary or Poland, but less so Poland, to block these sanctions. So she's never really gone as far on Russia as I think Americans especially would like her to. But I think part of that is the result of the Obama, the Obama pivot to Asia, which almost de-emphasized the role of Europe to American security and foreign policy. So I think Americans would like Germany to take a more proactive role, but I don't think Germans want to take a more proactive role. Thank Alexander Bowen for his insight on that. You can hear the entire episode uh, wherever you're getting this broadcast or podcast, whichever way you are watching. Uh, do seek that out. Alexander Bowen, the full episode of the Hertel podcast where he breaks down the German elections, Angela Merkel, Olaf Scholz, and what it all means. We'll be right back with more Hertel Radio right after this. Welcome back to Hertel Radio. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Uh, a little bit of a lighter topic on a day full of heavy stuff. Uh, and I'm getting this from our friend Keith Conrad. He has a uh, newsletter called New Side Quest. It has uh, neat odds and ends on it. I recommend you seek that out on Substack. But uh, who among us has not had to try to hide something from a significant other, loved one, or somebody in our household? Well, a man in Great Britain uh, really took this to another level from Fox News. Uh, man hides Britain's largest model train set from girlfriend. Simon George spent six months building a 200 foot long model train set before his new girlfriend discovered it. Um, according to George, he spent eight years building it, which recreates a one and a half mile long stretch of real train tracks located in West Yorkshire. Uh, the model recreates the look of the area as it existed in the 80s. It all started because I used to spend a lot of time at Heaton Lodge as a 12-year-old kid watching the trains go by, George explained. I had happy memories of it all. I wasn't even into railroad models. I could have easily parked a corner shop and had memories of it depicted 1980s, and it used to be with lots of coal trains before the miners' strikes. When we were children, we have our own special places, but for me, I used to come here as a child and spend so much time watching the freight trains go past. George spent 330000 uh, U.S. dollars to bring the model to life. It is currently being displayed at a local market hall until the 21st of December. And what was really funny about this is how did he hide it? Well, he took out a lease in the basement of an office building and he told his girlfriend it was where he was storing wine. Not sure how that works, but good for George. It's a mighty train set. I hope he finds a good place for it and I wish him well in his interpersonal relationships, patching that up. Uh, thank you for listening to Herd Tell today. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Uh, however you're listening, uh, if you're listening on the live streams from Big Talker FM, we sure appreciate you. Um, Facebook comments on those streams, we try to read those. We will get back to you. Also, if you're on the podcasts, uh, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you're listening to us, please take a minute to do a rating and a comment that lets folks know that our little program is worth checking out uh, and gives us a little bit wider audience to let more folks know what we're doing. If you really want to help us out, uh, share one of those links. Uh, almost all those platforms, they give you the option to share. Share a link on your social media. Let people know where they can find us. Uh, and we will try to continue to give them news and information without all the caterwauling that's been going on in the news cycle. We think people want it. We'll keep doing it as long as you're listening. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be back tomorrow for Thursday. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Wherever you and yours are, we hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. Y'all take care until next time. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. So much